Hey, thank you for joining us for Prophecy in the News this week. I'm your host, Kevin Clarkson. We are talking about the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And I rolled those out in a former program. We were looking at the word mystery, the concept mystery, as it's found in the New Testament. And there are mysteries in the Bible that uh, are a wonderful thing for us to explore. And as we look at those in the New Testament, I'll kind of review the last uh, teaching we gave quickly. But as we look at those, we realize a mystery in the New Testament is not a whodunit. Okay, everybody loves a mystery and solving it. The ultimate solution is to find who's responsible. The mysteries in the Bible, we know who did it. God. The Lord is behind these mysteries. And so it's not like a crime scene. What it is with a cover-up, what it is is a glorious uncovering or revelation of what he's going to show. And in the New Testament, and we'll see this clearly in other passages we'll be looking at in further programs, uh, a mystery is something that formerly was not made known unto man, but has since been disclosed in the New Testament revelation given in our New Testament through the writings of the apostles. That's a great thing. And most all of these mysteries in some way touch in a very important manner the return of the Lord. Now, just to survey with you, we did a program and I, I looked at the main mysteries that are mentioned in the New Testament. And just to briskly name them, we'll be talking about Israel's blindness in this current age until the Lord removes the veil. Uh, then we'll be talking about the rapture and the resurrection. Paul said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The New Testament church is made up of Jew and Gentile. What a surprise. The New Testament church as the ultimate co regent the queen the bride of the ruler of the universe through all eternity uh, the mystery of the continuing spread uh, and destruction of sin climaxing in the mystery of iniquity or mystery of lawlessness the mystery of god coming in human form to save the world the mystery of godliness the mystery of the gospel and finally the mystery babylon which kind of sums up wraps up the uh, the tale of these mysteries we're going to be unpackaging these and i didn't name some others there are a few more that we can look at but i want to look at the a little more in depth with you and we want to take this program today so i hope you have a bible we're going to be talking about the idea of israel's blindness the mystery of the blindness of israel and what you need to do is get a bible if you've got a bible on a tablet uh like an ipad or a phone an iPhone you, with an app, you won't be able to see this as, as well, but I wanted to illustrate it to you with a real good old-fashioned hard Bible, okay? A hard copy Bible. I'm going to take my Bible here, and I'm going to open up to Matthew chapter 1. And it doesn't help me with my Bible, because I would love to know how many pages there are, but it says page 3, and a cover page that says the New Testament. So my Bible started renumbering when it hit the New Testament. But the Old Testament is actually, in my Bible, 1,184 pages. So just to give you a visual graphic, okay? And there's an, actually the New Testament, there's some notes here and concordance and maps. My New Testament is actually about this thick, okay? See that? And my Old Testament is actually, and I'm getting to Genesis 1, this thick. So... This is the old, and this is the new, okay? Now, I dare say that if we believe the Lord has ultimately and fully and completely revealed himself in Christ, the newest is the latest, greatest, and best. But that's no reason to ignore this. So we're going to turn to Romans chapter 11 and talk about a mystery. Did all of this not matter? When Jesus died and rose and the church began, was God done with Israel? We have a lot of our friends that believe that. A lot of people in Christian churches believe that. It's called replacement theology. The idea that the church has somehow supplanted, usurped, replaced the nation of Israel. That God somehow had to go to plan B because, well, plan A just didn't quite work out. But actually, folks that think that haven't seen the mystery unfolded. It's right here before our eyes in the Bible. So let's come, if we may, to Romans chapter 11 and we're going to be reading verses 25 to 29 once you leave your scripture open to this passage because romans 9 10 and 11 these three chapters actually have to do with the jew the nation of israel the people of israel all right so let's begin reading in romans chapter 11 verse 25 paul says i would not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery 
Well, it's not the will of the Lord that we be ignorant of this, but a lot of people are. Paul said, I don't want you, brethren, to be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits. And here's the mystery. That blindness, in part, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, and here he quotes from Isaiah, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they, and that's the Jews, Israel, concerning the gospel, they are right now enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the fathers, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They are beloved for the father's sakes, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Now, let's just put this in a larger context of the book of Romans. I love the book of Romans. Anytime Romans is studied in history, seriously, it's brought a real revival, okay? And Romans 1 through 8 describe the gospel. They give it in a glorious fashion. The lostness of man, the lostness of the world, the lostness of culture. You can be lost as a pagan. You can be lost as a practicing religious person. You can be lost as a moralist. Any way you want to line it up without Christ, you're lost. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, you're lost. That's Romans 1 through 3. And then at the very last verses of chapter 3, Paul brings up Jesus Christ and the fact that we are justified, made right, saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And it was his death on the cross, and Paul mentions the word, he is a propitiation for our sins. And that's the idea of the high priest sprinkling the blood on the day of atonement on the mercy seat. That's what Jesus was actually doing on Calvary. His blood was sprinkled to cover our sins and provide forgiveness. Then he says we're justified. That's a courtroom word. It's a word picture of a judge who, though you are guilty, uh, clears you and you are able to be acquitted and walk out of the courtroom free. There's a third term in Romans at the end of chapter 3 that says we're redeemed and we are instantly standing in a slave market where we were being auctioned and we're slaved and in shackles and we cannot free ourselves and Jesus Christ steps up and pays the ransom, pays the redemption price and buys us out of slavery unto himself. So right there at the end of Romans 3 are three beautiful quick flash word pictures about our salvation. And then in chapter 4 it goes into Abram's life and reinforces the fact that Abram was saved really not as the a Jew yet, though his bloodline was such, and he had already been called uh, to, to found a nation, but before he was circumcised, before he actually had that moment of the official covenant signing with his circumcision, he was justified by faith in Genesis 15, and he's not circumcised until later in the book. And Paul makes the whole point that salvation is entirely and utterly by faith. Those who uh, are of the father Abraham by blood and are Jewish are saved by faith and those who are of the father of Abraham the father by faith are saved by the same kind of faith he had so chapter 4 and then Romans 5 through 8 they really begin to explore in an incredible way the Christian life how God uses our trials how he uses our sufferings to actually work in us a far greater weight of glory and how that tribulation actually allows the the Holy Spirit's love to be freshly poured out into our heart. And then we move into, if we, if, as we go through Romans 5, the fact that we are either in Adam or we are in Christ. And depending on which address you live in, that's how your eternity will be spent. Those who come to Christ are forever forgiven, justified, and free. Those who perish in Adam will be lost, exiled from paradise, kicked out of the garden, so to speak. Then chapter 6, 7, and 8 of Romans. And these are deep, wonderful waters or mountain peaks to climb, whichever image you like. Romans 6, 7, and 8, I like to think of them this way. Paul said in Galatians, not I, but Christ. I think Romans 6 and 7 are explaining it's not I. It's not I in my sin. I keep sinning. And the Lord has crucified this flesh, the body of this sin. And if I walk in that and claim that truth, I can live above sin. Chapter 7, I can't live under the law, though, or I will fail again. The law simply provokes sin. It brings a revival, uh, the King James says. Sin was revived when the commandment came. 
So uh, actually, the law brings a revival of sin. Think about that. God gave the law really not, uh, well, to reveal his heart and to reveal his standard for us, but ultimately to show us that we can never meet that standard on our own. Not I. But then we step into the glories of Romans 8. And it begins with no condemnation and chapter 8 ends with no separation. What a beautiful thing. And the whole fact of chapter 8 is it's not I, it's Christ. And whereas in Romans 7, as Paul struggled to try to please God in his own strength, keeping the rules and the laws, he says, I, me, I, I, many, many, many times when we step into chapter 8, we hear the thrust and the repeat and the echo of the word spirit. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit prays for us, the Spirit. So what, what a glorious thing. A lot of people kind of conclude their study of Romans right there, and they just come to a screeching halt and say, got that. And they never really bother much with chapters 9, 10, and 11. Others, however, plowed on ahead. And during the Reformation, and I want to say this, and I, I want to say this kindly and, and lovingly, um, I'm Calvinistic, but I'm not Calvinist. And uh, you can choose to write me or argue with me, but I will just say that, you know, better minds than yours and mine have argued over the centuries about uh, the mystery of predestination and human free will, and they've reached no nice conclusion. We leave some things in the mysteries of God, and that's where I want you to see. But I want you to understand that Christianity in its roots, and we'll see this very clearly, did not begin in 16th century Europe, all right? I have a lot of friends that call themselves Reformed, and they kind of believe that, you know. They love to smoke a pipe and, and, and have a big library of books and be theologues, and that's, that's all fine and well, but, um, you know, the roots of Christianity go back to Judaism. Romans 11 says that very clearly. We're not to be lifted up in our own conceits. And why I'm saying this to you is, imagine if you were uh, John Calvin or Martin Luther or uh, Ulrich Zwingli, and you were living in that day, and when you came to Romans 9, 10, and 11, you looked down at Israel, the literal physical land, and it was barren. There was nothing there. There were a few, very few, Jewish people scattered about. There were Muslims there. And as you read this, you would, you would have a hard time. It's easier to believe something, even in prophecy, after the fact than beforehand. And so when, when the Reformers and people got to Romans 9, they took this idea of election and swerved away, as they tried to understand it, from being what it is, national election. They swerved all the way to making it personal election. Uh, they made it about uh, salvation rather than service. And they really missed the thrust of Romans 9, 10, and 11. And I think at that point, it led into great mischief as they built speculation upon speculation upon speculation that has often brought many people to, uh, you know, just really not doing much of anything for the kingdom of God because they're sitting on their hands just saying it's all done and decreed and, and all, and, and uh, it's rather fatalistic. But the Bible says we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Bible says whosoever will may come. And the Bible, when it does address this word predestination or elect, it says in 1 Peter 1 that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it says whom he foreknew, he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son. So there's a foreknowing there. Now, the question we can't answer and the nut that we can't really crack open is how much of that involves us and how much of that involves God. God has perfect foreknowledge, and uh, we can talk and talk in theological circles forever. But the point is, God does not mock us. He commands all men everywhere to repent. We're to preach the gospel to every creature under heaven. And the idea is that the gospel is the transforming power of God, and whosoever will may come. So when we come to Romans 9, we need to understand, first of all, in Romans 10 and 11, God's election of Israel. God's election of Israel. And you're going to have to listen fast because our time is getting by. Election, as I said, in these chapters, is ultimately to service for God, not personal salvation. Election is national, not individual. 
So let me just show you what I'm talking about. And I'll, I'll bring up the passages that are usually thrown up to oppose that. Chapter 9, verse 13. Uh, this is one that those that believe in individual personal election will love to cite. Uh, Romans 9, 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. I've, I've discovered a lot of these people that are real, real strong into this view are also uh, sometimes kind of angry about it. You know, I don't know what the deal is, but they're, they're just really, um, I don't know, they're, they need a good dose of Holy Spirit love. I'll just say that in love. Um, okay, let's look at that verse. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Hmm. Wow, you mean God hated Esau. Well, let's take the word of God. Where did that verse come from? Did that come from Genesis? From the account of Jacob and Esau? No. Nope. It comes from Malachi. Malachi chapter 1, the opening verses. And God is speaking there to Jacob as a nation, Israel. And Esau is their neighbor nation, the Edomites. And God says, I've loved you. But they're questioning his love. And they say, well, what are you saying that? I mean, we've been decimated. We've come back from exile. We're having a hard time with occupying armies. What do you mean you love us, you favorites? He said, well, just look over there at Edom, at Esau. They've been obliterated. They've been wiped out. They're nothing now. They're barren wilderness I'm blessing you, I'm restoring you, I'm returning you. The fact of the matter, God was speaking of nations in that verse in Malachi that Paul is quoting in Romans. And I love Israel or Jacob. I hated Esau or Edom. Now, that doesn't mean that God hates the Edomites individually, but as a nation, they're not elected under his eternal purpose to be a priest to all the other nations of the world like Israel was called to be. Then let's go to one more, Romans 9, 17. <clears throat> I would just want to say to you that this one is one that's often, uh, I think, applied the same way to say, well, now, wait a minute. This is definitely an individual, and I won't disagree with you. I would, however, point some facts out, all right? Romans 9, 17, the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might shew my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will, he hardeneth. So without having time to go back into Exodus fully on that, let me tell you, Pharaoh is not his name. We're not sure which Pharaoh this was. We have an idea it might have been Ramses II. But this Pharaoh is, the word Pharaoh means like president or king. That's the Egyptian word. So it's not talking about a person by name. Now certainly this was an individual. But let's just realize in the bigger picture, the kings, the individuals, uh, rulers, of, of the ages, like Nebuchadnezzar, like Darius the Mede, uh, like Cyrus who ordered the exiles to go back and rebuild the temple, like Pharaoh here, God has used the world leaders to shape and move the direction of his people, the nation of Israel. And so in that sense, this is speaking of their, really their place in history. And I would say to you that God, even to this day, gives very special attention to national leaders. They're not more important in the ultimate scheme of things. They stand equal at the foot of the cross. There's lost sinners who need to be saved. But in the scheme of authority that they've been entrusted and oversight of nations that they've been entrusted, they have a lot that they're going to have to answer for. And it's a fact, as we know about principalities and powers, demonic spirits, that they concentrate on power centers. And so places like Washington, D.C. and Brussels, Belgium and Rome and London, and other capitals of the world, and uh, uh, for that matter, uh, Moscow, those are places where demonic presences are very strong because they're trying to infiltrate and influence those centers of power. And the point is, we've got to understand that uh, those folks, in a very special way, also have God's hand working in their life. Now, as to Pharaoh, the individual, when you go back into Exodus, here's what you discover, okay? It says that he hardened his heart. It says God hardened his heart. And it says his heart was hardened without mentioning an agent. All three are in Hebrew. But the very first one is he hardened his heart. And it was only after that that God hardened his heart. So there's the play of the hand of God and the free will of man. Let's just answer that, though, and say that election in Romans is a privilege Romans 9, 4, and 5, look at the Israelites. It says, and that's Paul's whole question in this passage, has God done with Israel? And he says in verse 4, 
These are the Israelites. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory, that's the Shekinah glory, the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers? That's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs. And of whom is concerning the flesh, Christ, Messiah came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Paul was saying, look what privilege the Jews had. They were given the law of God, the word of God. They were given the covenants of God. They literally saw the presence of God come down as they wandered through the wilderness as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And when they dedicated the temple and the tabernacle, that, that shaft of divine Shekinah glory came flashing in in a mighty way. They were privy to all of that. They also had the patriarchs. And then they had the Messiah come from their bloodline. Wow, that is a special election of privilege. And, you know, the Jews throughout history have kind of had a joke and they've, you know, made a, made, made a deal about it. And I understand they say things like, God, if we're your chosen people because they've suffered so much. They said, could you choose someone else for a while? <laughs> anyway, let's come quickly to God's deflection of Israel. God's election. But there was a time of deflection. And this is God's mirror of justice. The fact of the matter is when the Messiah came, he came into his own and they received him not. The Jewish nation rejected Christ. Now, our replacement theology friends say that was a once and for all, never again brokered deal. But I say unto you that that was for a generation. God may write off a generation, but not a nation. And uh, that's the hand of God. Even as the children in the wilderness didn't have the faith to go into Canaan, God said, you're going to wander 40 years in the wilderness, and I'll start over with the next generation. Well, God started over with many generations of Jewish people, and they've still not all come to their Messiah. But the scripture says there will be a day. God did not reject the nation whom he foreknew. And that's very clear from these chapters. In fact, if we go to chapter 11 and read verses 1 to 6, you'll see exactly what I mean. Uh, verse 1, chapter 11. I say that hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Paul said, I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. And he goes on to explain that he's always had a believing remnant. And he cites the example of Elijah in the days of King Ahab and the awful Baal uh, worship that was going on. So yes, there is a temporary deflection, but not a rejection of Israel by God. And so during this time of blindness, this mystery, the Gentiles are coming in. And God took a bad thing and made it into a good thing like he is always able to do. Isn't God great? He'll do that in your life too. Something may look tragic. It may look bad. It may even cause you pain. But if you'll trust God and believe that he is able to work all things together for good to those who love him, you will see the hand of God bringing forth good out of bad. I think of uh, uh, the Holocaust. I think of uh, all the Jews that were uh, taken to the chambers of gas and uh, ovens in, in Nazi Germany and how horrific and horrible it was. Yet was not that something that God used to begin to cause the Jewish people to rise up and flee from Europe and literally head and restock their land once it became a nation state in 1948. So God used something bad to bring forth something good. And it's the very same in these passages as the Jews of Jesus' generation rejected him. The door was open for the church to take the gospel to all the nations of the earth so that all the people of the world might hear that Christ has come not just as the Messiah of the Jews, but as the Savior of all mankind. And I tell you, God is amazing. And then we'll come to this fact. We've spoken of God's election of Israel and his deflection. Then there's God's protection of Israel. That is that he has preserved them through the ages. He has not allowed them. That generation that rejected him, they were judged. Titus, the Roman general, came in 70 AD and they destroyed Jerusalem. They tore down the temple. They burned it. They say blood and gold ran together in the streets because gold uh, was plating the outside of Herod's magnificent temple. But God is not through with the Jew. Romans 10, 1, brethren, Paul said, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. And we want to see Jewish people saved. And we ought to pray and witness to those. Uh, even though they seem to be blind, we need to pray for a spiritual awakening in their lives if we know them personally, to live before them, to, sh to love them, to share uh, our faith in Christ with them and trust the Holy Spirit to give you the leading and the time and the words to say. But, but know that God is still protecting them. They will be preserved in another chapter and another time. Uh, Ezekiel 37, uh, they've through the na uh, ages survived and God in 1948 birthed the nation in a day and they came forward and returned to their land until the fullness of the Gentiles has come 
in, in, as we read in Romans 11, uh, God is still working those things out. The final step in this will be God's ultimate perfection of Israel. And it says, so all Israel shall be saved in the verses we read. We just have time to comment momentarily. You want to get your Bibles and read Zechariah 12, verses 6 through 10. When the Messiah appears over Jerusalem, when Jerusalem is surrounded by the nations of the earth, and this is really uh, at a pivotal moment at the Battle of Armageddon, they're being attacked, they're at the very verge of destruction and disaster, and Jesus appears, and it says they will look on him whom they pierced, and they will mourn for him as you mourn for a son. And God will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication. And many Israelis will turn and embrace their Messiah at that day. This is going to be an amazing thing. At that time, apostate Jews will have already been killed or died, but the remnant will believe when he appears. This is toward the end of the age. This is not that far off if the Lord's return is as near as I think it may be. And I want to say it doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or whether you're one of the other nations, Gentile, whatever your ethnicity Jesus came to be the Savior of all. He came to give his life on the cross so that we could have everlasting life. He rose from the dead to bring life and immortality to light. And he offers that to you today. That's the glorious message of the gospel. Right now, God is using the church to preach the gospel. Gentiles and Jews are being called out and saved by the work of God. But there's coming a day When the church, and that's our next mystery, the mystery of the rapture, the mystery of the resurrection, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Catch us on that one next time. But you know, when that happens at that moment, attention will shift to the nations of the earth, and God will again use Israel as the prince among the nations. And it will be they who first embrace the false Messiah, the Antichrist, and then they are betrayed, And realize what has been done to them. And as these things play out. Scripture has foretold them all. And I hope you'll join us for this series. Of exciting mysteries. Until then. I want to urge those of you who may be watching. Who have never had a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is real. And vital. And personal. To call on his name. The Bible says if you call on his name. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. Shall be saved. Romans 10 13. Right in the middle of election chapters. If you're a whosoever, you will, you may come, you call on his name and trust him. Till then, we keep looking up.